On a lonely battlefield, you meet your opponent for a skirmish that will decide the fate of your army. These are the first words inscribed in the Rulebook of Stratego, a two-player strategy game drawing inspiration from the Napoleonic Wars. Each player has identical piece compositions, but both are free to set up their pieces however they wish. Each piece has its own designated rank and name, with higher numbers corresponding to stronger pieces. Six of these pieces are bombs, which are immovable. Of course, each person also doesn't know how the other person is setting up their pieces, adding a level of information asymmetry that isn't seen in common board games like chess or checkers. After each player has decided where they want to position their pieces, the real game begins. Players take turns moving one piece at a time, moving one square at a time, following only up, down, left, or right with no diagonals. The only exception to this rule is the scout, who can move like a rook in chess, i.e. any squares in its line of sight, or the bombs and the flags, which can't move. Players cannot move their pieces into allied pieces, nor can they move a piece into the lakes or over the lakes in case of the scout. To stop degenerate gameplay, Stratego has what is called the two square rule, where no piece can move back and forth between the same two squares for three turns in a row. In addition, they also have what is called the more square rule, where a piece cannot endlessly chase an opposing piece it can't ever attack. This tends to prevent circular goose chases around the lake when there are like four pieces left. If a player chooses to move one of their pieces into the square that an enemy piece occupies, a battle commences. The conditions are pretty straightforward. Whichever piece has a higher rank gets to stay on the square, while the piece that loses will be removed from the board. Ties mean that both pieces are removed from the board. If an offensive piece captures the enemy flag, then the offensive player wins the game. If an offensive piece attacks an enemy bomb, then both the bomb and the offensive piece are removed from the game. There are two more special interactions. First, a minor, or three piece, can defuse bombs without being eliminated. Second, if the offensive player's spy attacks the defensive player's marshal, or 10, then the marshal is removed from the board while the spy is not. However, if the roles are reversed, and if any piece attacks the spy, then the spy is removed. There are two win conditions. Either a player can capture the opponent's flag, or a player can capture all of the opponent's movable pieces. If an opponent cannot make a legal move, then they lose the game. Technically, there exists the possibility of a draw. If each player's flag is surrounded by bombs, and each player has exactly one piece, and that piece is not a minor. The relative simplicity of the rules has made Stratego a popular classroom name. I myself played it regularly in elementary school, often to the chagrin of my teachers. Yet, is there an overall strategy that is considered optimal? The really difficult part of constructing an optimal strategy is the vast amount of possibility that lies in this 10x10 board. On average, each game takes around 381 moves, but it is very common to see games last above a thousand turns. There are 10 to the power of 535 legal positions. For reference, the universe has been existing for less than 10 to the the power of 18 seconds, so you would need a mind-boggling amount of parallel universes before you saw every legal position. Even the amount of legal starting positions is 10 to the power of 33, or 1 decillion in English. Once again, longer than the amount of seconds that have passed in the known universe. To put this even more into perspective, chess, a world-renowned sport, game, or whatever you want to call it, averages 60 turns a game and only has around 10 to the power of 123 possible game states. It turns out that the only thing larger than the number of Stratego positions is the number of people who watch my videos who aren't subscribed. Seriously though, it'd be kind of huge if that number went up by even just a small percentage. Feel free to if you enjoyed my content. Anyway, back to the video topic. There are some strategies in general that can be put to use. For instance, it's usually better to keep your flag in the very back, surrounded entirely by bombs. This typically occurs in the corner, where you can hide the flag with just two bombs rather than three, but that lends itself into predictability, so it's obviously a mix-up. In the late game, if a bunch of pieces end up removed from the board, it also becomes possible to surround your flag with very powerful pieces if the bombs also explode, guaranteeing that it is safe. Some people often set up fake flags with bombs surrounding a very powerful piece. Other common heuristics include keeping your spy close to your general, or nine piece. Typically, the only opposing piece that can take out your general is the opposing marshal, so giving your opponent as little time to reposition after such a major blow is crucial. Furthermore, keeping your miners and scouts in the game, especially in the late stages, is essential. Being able to defuse or poke out unknown pieces is basically the only way to win if your opponent is putting a lot of pressure on you early. Lastly, but most importantly, the key of Stratego is to avoid giving away information. Try keeping just a few pieces known to your opponent as possible. One thing many people don't consider is the act of moving a piece itself removes the possibility of that piece being a bomb. Keeping things ambiguous means your opponent is less likely to attack. So is that it then? Just memorize your opponent's pieces, values, and play from some general heuristics? Wouldn't that mean that anyone can just win Stratego? Isn't this game entirely luck-based? Well, not necessarily. 
Every year, the International Stratego Federation holds the Stratego World Championships, and every year, you see consistent names in the top brackets of these tournaments. For reference, these are around 10 to 15 round tournaments with cash prizes, yet the variance between players isn't high enough to suggest that luck is the only aspect of the game. In fact, ever since 1997, out of the 25 tournaments since then, with some years being dropped or cancelled, there have only been 32 unique people in the top 3 of all cumulative World Championship Classic Stratego competitions. Then, then, in 2022, Google released their take on the game, Deep Nash, the best Stratego bot in the world, winning over 97% of games versus other bots, and 84% of games versus the top human players, how did Google solve Stratego? Before we discuss strategy further, we have to discuss why Deep Nash is considered such a breakthrough. Typically, when it comes to game engines like Stockfish for chess, computers leverage their ability to store exponentially more memory than humans to be better than us. Using chess as an example, bots use what is called an evaluation function to determine how winning or losing a position is for the computer. This is very complex, but generally boils down to the number of legal moves that someone can make, the material on the board, king safety in some quantified measure, etc. The computer's search for the best move often means evaluating every possible move that it can make, what every possible move the opponent could make to each of those moves, and so on. Optimizations like alpha beta pruning exist where the computer remembers the best move it has tried so far. If it ever observes a move that the opponent can make that will put the opponent in a better position than the current optimum, the computer will stop evaluating that line of decisions and move on to the next possible move. It should be relatively obvious why these sort of deterministic solutions fail now with Stratego. For one, the size of the decision tree, being orders of magnitude larger in Stratego compared to chess, means that the computation time for finding the best move is way too impractical to ever test or play. Second and more importantly, Stratego bots attempting the strategy can't actually know what the opponent's best move is since they don't actually know what the pieces the opponent has to counter them during the early stages of the game. So given all this, how did Google Deep Mind's Deep Nash achieve such consistent rates of success? The answer? Shockingly enough, no one really knows. Let's explain. From a high level, Deep Nash is a prime example of reinforcement learning. Essentially, Deep Nash plays against itself billions of times, noticing what strategies work and what don't. At first, moves might be completely random. However, the outcome of said move is graded with some reward function. From the paper, the reward function looks a little like this. This might look really big and scary, but component-wise, it's actually quite simple. The left-hand side of the equation represents how Deep Nash evaluates the reward for the move. The higher the reward, the more likely the bot is to play that move in the future. The first term in the equation is just the reward for player i when they make some action a i and the opponent plays some action a negative i. This is just how good an individual move is in a vacuum. For example, if the enemy flag is captured, this term is an infinite positive reward, since that is the best we can do. However, However, Stratego is a zero-sum game. Any benefit for the opponent is a loss for the player, so conversely, if Deep Nash's flag is taken, that is a negatively infinite reward. It is important to remember that there are more rewards than just winning or losing a game. Any amount of information, such as an opponent's piece being revealed, or even just a positional advantage gained, will be evaluated and utilized. The second term is called a regularization term. This term is negative and penalizes Deep Nash from making moves that are too different from its baseline policy. This discourages it from making brash and unorthodox moves moves, such as putting its flag in the first row with no bombs around it. Mind you, that doesn't mean that unorthodox strategies are impossible. Remember, every action taken by the bot is drawn from a probability distribution, so while technically all moves are possible, it is just significantly more likely that the most probable moves will be chosen when you can have dozens of legal options at a time. The last term is also a regularization term, but from the perspective of the opponent. This gives a reward if the opponent's chosen move aligns with what Deep Nash presumes to be its opponent's base policy. The higher this term is, is, this means Deep Nash can feel confident it doesn't have to readjust its entire strategy either and can be in full control of the game. The actual value of these terms were tested billions of times when Deep Nash was training against itself, and the past two generations of itself. Why include past generations? Well, imagine you are trying to teach a bot how to play rock, paper, scissors. Throwing rock against a computer that initially chose scissors might make it think that rock is a really good move. A naive agent would then always pick rock, letting you pick paper, causing it to pick paper, and so on. This manner of training preserves the ability for Deep Nash to adapt, while also preventing it from being too volatile to form a strategy. Every time Deep Nash eventually chooses to make a move, the rewards evaluated update its probabilities on how to play. This form of thinking allows Deep Nash to find a Nash equilibrium, a concept in game theory that states that each player's strategy is as best as it can be given what the other players are doing. So if any players try to deviate from their current strategy while the other keeps theirs, the deviator actually won't gain an advantage overall. This is also why it's called Deep Nash, as the bot keeps training against itself the updates to the rewards become smaller and smaller until it converges to a stable mixed strategy. But beyond this, there is literally zero explanation on how Deep Nash plays. 
The reason why many AI supercomputers these days are so fascinating is because they train solely against themselves. There is no human input or starting point for the bot to derive a strategy, meaning Deep Nash remains entirely robust and is not susceptible to strategic errors that its creators might have overlooked. Even worse, Deep Nash is unfortunately still private to Google, so we aren't allowed to play it ourselves. Instead, we're left looking at the video footage Deep Nash has left us when it was in competition with other high-level bots. There will be four links in the description leading to four of the VODs, but I'll take the rest of the video to offer what I analyze from watching the replays. Keep in mind that I'm no world-class Stratego player, and that this is a relatively limited sample size too. With that being said, here's my seven takeaways on how to always beat your friends at Stratego, courtesy of Google. Number one, Deep Nash never put any bombs in the first two rows during setup. Flags always had at least two bombs next to them, and no flag was anywhere besides the very back row. 50% of the time, flags were also kept in the corners. It appears that the bot prioritizes the freedom to move over surprising the enemy with a bomb randomly up front. Number two, the marshal, or the 10, was always in the third row. The average value of the pieces in the first row was 4.4, 4.6, 5.1, and 5 for each game respectively. Meanwhile, the averages of the pieces in the second row was 5.3, 5.4, 4.5, and 5.2 respectively. Note that I didn't ascribe a value to the spy, so games 2 and 4 were a sum divided by 9 instead of 10. In either case, the spy was never in the front row and was right next to the general or the 9 piece around 50% of the time. Number 3. There was only a minor in the first two rows twice, while the other four were always in the back two rows. The only time in the early game that Deep Nash gave up a minor is when something else attacks said minor, revealing its true value to the opponent. If this occurred, the minor just gets sacrificed for information. Number 4. Deep Nash loves using scouts or twos really early, often just sending them straight into an enemy piece right away. Then, for the first 200 to 400 moves of the game, Deep Nash never moved more than 6 pieces or revealed more than 6 pieces at a time. That's right, not only is most of Deep Nash's moves in anticipation, but it only moves a handful of pieces at a time, keeping the vast majority of its pieces still to increase ambiguity about which pieces are bombs. Most beginner and intermediate players seem to think that Stratego is all about space control, but in reality, it seems to be much more focused on ambiguity and information control. Granted, this is a lot easier to do when you're a supercomputer who can remember the exact value of every piece and also remember which pieces have actually moved though. Number 5. When looking for space in the middle game, Deep Nash constantly uses bold bluffs to scare off the enemy marker or 10 piece. You can see this in game 3 around move 300 where it pretends that its miner is a spy while making sure that Deep Nash's own marshal, which is known to the enemy at the time, is nearby, giving the illusion of protecting its spy. Number 6. It's about the quality, not the quantity of the remaining pieces. Maintaining one miner and a guaranteed piece advantage is usually enough to force the opponent to resign. Out of the four games, none of them were decided by capturing the opponent's flag. In the three that Deep Nash won, it amassed such a large material advantage that the opponent forfeited. In the one that it lost, Deep Nash's opponents took a really risky gamble that took out a captain, or a 6, a relatively high value piece that snowballed into taking all of Deep Nash's pieces. Number 7, remember that you are a human, and playing, presumably, another human. Most people you play won't bother keeping track of everything that has moved on the table. Your best bet is to maintain a running list of everything that has been captured, cross-referencing it with what pieces are still possibly remaining on the board. Look for common bomb patterns like an X or a big cluster, and if you've played the same person countless times, make sure to utilize past games to your advantage, and mix up your strategy too. At the end of the day, regardless of skill level, we're all still human, at least for now. Let's take the time to enjoy the company of friends or take pride in competition. Serious or relaxed, we can all appreciate a good game of Stratego. Well, there's another video on the channel. Sorry it took so long to get another strategy game analysis out. It's been what, four videos since the Mafia one? I know these are more popular than my statistical brain teaser videos, but these take a lot longer to make. There's so much research going into reading these random papers and looking for videos and resources. Unsurprisingly, talking about strategy often takes more time than math, and animating every asset takes way more time than usual. Excuses aside though, I'll be doing my best to get these out. If you enjoy, please subscribe. Your support is what keeps me going. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time.